It's a startling fact that breast cancer diagnoses have been on the rise in younger women. Here to shed some light on what's been happening and what you can do to protect yourself and your loved ones is Dr. Elias Abid, Medical Director of the Hennessy Institute for Cancer Prevention and Applied Molecular Medicine, and also from the Hennessy Institute Genetic Counselor Jessica Russo. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thanks of for having course. us. Of course. So let's just jump right in. Um, Dr. Abid, can you tell us more about the trend of the increasing diagnoses in younger women and what you've been seeing and what's really going on there? Yeah, we have noticed uh, that there is a trend for a younger age of diagnosis, not just for breast cancer, but for multiple other cancers. Uh, I'll start with an example on colon cancer where we used to tell individuals to start screening and that's for the average risk uh, individuals, start at age 50. And now we start at age 45 because we know that we're seeing younger age uh, for the you know, diagnosis for colon cancer. And we're seeing this trend in other diseases, including breast cancer. So normally, I guess, when referring to breast cancer, you get your mammogram at age 40. So should women be starting to get mammograms earlier? What is that looking like? As much as we know for now yeah. that everyone should be looking at their own family history, their own risk factors, and discuss with their providers about what uh, age should they start. But for the average risk population, the age in the United States is age 40. And for now, we still feel it is a safe age to get started at. But if you do have a family history, then definitely you need to discuss with your provider about uh, when to start. Okay. So talking about family history, um, I feel like in today's day and age, everyone knows someone, unfortunately, who has gone through breast cancer, whether it's a family member or a friend. Um, and this is something that applies to me directly. Um, I lost my aunt to breast cancer about 15 years ago. Um, so my dad did genetic testing because it was something that he knew ran in the family. He found out about genetic testing, and he actually tested positive for the BRCA gene. Um, so I also did genetic testing because my father tested positive and I also tested positive for BRCA2. Um, so I do want to have a larger conversation around genetic testing. Um, but before we get into genetic testing, what are some other factors that make candidates more high risk or women more high risk for breast cancer? So besides genetics, what are some other factors? When we look at breast cancer in general, we know that the vast majority of breast cancers are not linked to family history or to genetics. Oh, okay. And that's probably about 70% of all breast cancers. But we do see it around us because breast cancer is a very common cancer. It's the most common cancer affecting women. One out of every eight women, we know that they're going to develop breast cancer. So if you look around you and you look at let's say eight women around you, you know that maybe one of them probably is going to have breast cancer. Now, looking at the other proportion of individuals with breast cancer, I said 30%. So 10% of those, so 10% of breast cancers would be linked to genetic predisposition, and 20% would be family history. So we're still talking here about family history as well as about a genetic predisposition. So I put that all together, you know, as knowing about your family history where some indiv individuals would not have a genetic predisposition, yet they still have that family history, and some others do have that genetic predisposition, just like you mentioned about yourself. So, and that information will become important and helpful for them because they know what to do about their risk and how to screen and modify their risk. This might be a silly question, but what is the difference between a genetic predisposition and family, uh, what did you refer to that as, I'm sorry? Familial or family history of breast yes, cancer. Yes, yeah. So when we, let's say if we are looking at 100 women with breast cancer, we're just not selecting anyone, and we just throw in genetic testing on all of them. So we'll probably find that 10 out of the 100 are gonna have a genetic predisposition for breast cancer, meaning an inherited DNA change or a mutation uh, such as the BRCA2 gene Got that it. you okay. mentioned. Yes. So this is what we call an inherited or genetic predisposition to cancer. And then the familial is you do the testing, the test is negative, but when you ask that individual, she would tell you 
my mom had breast cancer and my two maternal aunts had breast cancer, but mom's test was negative, my aunt's test was negative. So we just feel that there's something going on there that we don't know what it is. Is it just an exposure that all the family had? Is it more like multiple genes, something that we are not testing for? There's a new concept of what we call polygenic risk, meaning multiple different genes coming together and playing a, and increasing the risk for individuals. So, but that's a sizable portion, you know, of of breast cancers. Now, our listeners and people who are watching us would say, well, only 10% of breast cancer is genetics. But if you look at the number of women diagnosed with breast cancer every year, over 300,000, if you look at that just by number itself, that's 10% of that is going to be 30,000 women or more every year have a genetic predisposition and have that mutation. So you can, you know, tell that knowing about genetic predisposition would help so many women don't get to that diagnosis stage or even if they get there get it at a much earlier stage rather than a late stage of diagnosis so when do you recommend that women or anyone really should look into genetic testing do you think it's something that everyone should do just as a precaution or do you think it's a specific type of person that should be looking at getting genetic testing done yeah, so I mean, there, there are certain criteria um, that do need to be met in terms of national guidelines, like the NCCN have some guidelines for BRCA testing, for Lynch testing. Um, there's other guidelines out there that are a bit more loose. Um, but frankly, if there's a family history of cancer, and if you yourself have had cancer, then genetic testing might be right for you. Um, and even outside of the guidelines, there's plenty of people that have had testing that don't meet those national criteria that are found to have mutations. And that does help them in the end to know that they're at an increased risk so that they can kind of get ahead of that. Exactly. Okay. Um, so what do these genetic tests look like? Yeah, so there's a there's a whole bunch of them. Okay. <laughs> so I guess you know when we're talking about the cancer testing, um, I mean it's evolved so much. Uh, you know, BRCA testing was done you know back in the early 2000s, uh, late 1990s, and it was just BRCA one and two. It was very simple. Um, now we can actually test for more than just BRCA one and two. We test for a lot of different genes relating to breast cancer. Um, there's genes relating to uh, colorectal cancer. And what we test now is in panels. So including genes not only BRCA1 and 2, genes like CHECK2, ATM, PALB2 that are similar to BRCA. Um, and, and the panels now can either be cancer specific, like say a breast and ovarian cancer panel, or um, just a multi-cancer panel that kind of covers everything. But it's easy enough where all you have to do is either send in a saliva sample or a blood sample and they can actually test for all those genes all at once. Do you need any sort of like prescription or I guess pre-authorization before getting these genetic tests done? So it is recommended that you go through a provider to do this, uh, preferably one that is, you know, uh, knows about genetics. Mm -hmm. um, but there are direct to consumer <laughs> tests that do offer this. Um, I think the important thing is that once you get that information, you follow up accordingly with a provider that um, has seen this test before and knows what to do with this information. Is there any sort of like risk assessment that you can take before getting the genetic testing done to see if this is something you would be interested in moving forward with? We, we do recommend that an individual talk to a provider who knows about genetic testing so yeah. that they understand. In general, if somebody is interested in knowing, they can probably either have a family history and they want to know, and or somebody just doesn't have family history, but they also want to know what the risk of cancer is. But let's just talk and focus about those with a family history, because many of us have at least a few family members with, with, with cancer, and we may not know that actually this particular cancer is indicative of a of a genetic predisposition. For example, you might have one aunt with ovarian cancer, but no other cancer. But that one diagnosis is actually important to know because it can help you detect a genetic predisposition. Mm -hmm. So I, I say this because if someone has a family history, they need to talk to the genetic counselor or the genetic cancer expert or provider who can lead, you know, tell them why they need the testing, what the testing should be and also because the majority of the test results are going to be negative test results 
those individuals still need to know what should I do. And that counseling is important on the back end after you get the result. So that's why it's important for anybody who's getting their testing to understand what the results are. Got it. Okay, so I'm sure this is a loaded question. I'm kind of going to go back to the panels that you were speaking of before. Um, what what are the different types? I, I know, so we talked about BRCA briefly. Um, what are the different panels that are done and also these different genetic mutations? What are they kind of linked to? That might be like a loaded <laughs> question there. So I guess just like the overview of it. What are you testing for? Yeah. What are these different genetic mutations yeah like you know we could probably spend a whole entire day yeah i'm and, sure and plus talking about all of the different genes um but really um it kind of it, of course it depends on the gene that is affected right so what we're looking for it's to, to put it simply it's spelling errors in these genes that everyone has right so everyone has a BRCA1 gene everyone has a BRCA2 gene what we're looking at is to see if there's differences within the instructions um, that causes that protein not to do its job to protect you from developing cancer so if there is that spelling error or what we know is a mutation then we know that that gene's not functioning properly and that you are at an elevated risk of developing cancer All right now depending on what gene is affected then we start talking about what cancer risks are associated and some genes have higher cancer risks than others um, for example we're, we'll go back to BRCA2 so BRCA2 has a significant risk for breast and ovarian cancer but there is also a risk for pancreatic cancer and male breast cancer and I'm sure you've heard that before um, but then we can switch to say the genes associated with the Lynch syndrome MSH2 um, if, there, if you were uh, found to have a mutation in that gene, then you would be at an elevated risk of developing colorectal cancer and uterine cancer and some other GI cancer risks, right? So it really just depends on what gene is affected. Um, so that way we can you know, estimate what your cancer risk is, but also family history does play an important role in risk, um, risk stratification as well. So uh, if you do test positive for these certain mutations, I know that you said it depends on which ones you test positive for and, and other factors as well, but what are the risk levels for, I guess, when talking about BRCA gene, like what is that risk level for breast cancer then? So for so there are the two different BRCA mutations, BRCA1 mm -hmm. and BRCA2, so mm -hmm. two different genes, and they, there is uh, some overlap between the two. And we know that for BRCA1, there is a risk for breast cancer which could be as high as 60 but up to 75 or 80 percent even up to 85 percent depending on what age limit you're looking at for a lifetime risk the same thing applies to BRCA2 mutation but what's different about BRCA1 and BRCA2 is we tend you know we end up seeing a little bit more earlier breast cancers with the BRCA1 and with BRCA2, for some reason, the breast cancer tend to occur a little bit later on. Oh, but that's not to say that we should select and screen women differently, whether they have BRCA1 or BRCA2, for breast cancer risk. We just do it the same way we start screening at age 25, because both groups can have uh, breast cancer very early on. It's just that it's a little bit more likely for BRCA1 than BRCA2. Now, the difference becomes with ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is much higher risk with BRCA1. The risk we used to say up to 40% and more recent studies are telling us up to 55%. So that's pretty high risk, especially for a disease like ovarian cancer that we cannot easily screen for. In fact, there is not a good screening test for ovarian cancer. So we, what we tell those women is you need to be a little bit more proactive and take out your ovaries and tubes by a certain age so that you avoid developing the cancer, ovarian cancer, that we mm. cannot screen for yet. What is that certain age? So for for BRCA1 mutation carriers, we say by age 40, mm. can be between 35 and 40 if a woman has finished her family planning. For BRCA2, we tend to say they can do it a little bit later. The risk of ovarian cancer is also lower than for BRCA1 mutation carriers. So their risk is up to 25 or 30%. So that's much less than that of BRCA1 carriers, but still the risk is there. And we tell them, start thinking about it somewhere between 40 and 45. By 45, probably they should you know, take out the ovaries and tubes. When someone does test positive for, I've been, I've been hearing you refer to it as BRCA, is that the 
the technical term for or is it BRCA, BRCA? That's whatever you want it doesn't to call matter. it. <laughs> yes, I, okay. <laughs> I think, I think uh, BRCA was, uh, was coined uh, by, by the lab that used to test for it's much it. much shorter. Was, it's easier yeah, to say. It's easier to say. I, I tend to use a little bit more the medical uh, you know, uh, pronunciation, which is BRCA1 or BRCA2. Okay. So when you do test positive, I'm bringing this back to... Um, more of the breast cancer conversation. Um, what do what is really the next steps for someone who tests positive for the breast cancer genetic mutations? What do you normally advise these patients to do? So we always look at their family history because mm -hmm. although we would say for BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation carrier, we would start screening with a breast MRI at age 25. Uh, we want to make sure we are more proactive if that individual had three cousins who have the same mutation but developed their breast cancer at age 25 or 26 or 27, then I might want to tailor their screening to even do it earlier than that. Uh, so we always look at the family history. But with without looking at the family history, there are guidelines that would help us and would help the individuals. What we do is where when we get the results, we provide individuals with a with a roadmap of when they when they need to start at which age, what kind of screening. So we start with the breast MRI at age 25. We add a mammogram at age 30. And for uh, ovarian cancer screening, although there's no good screening test, we tell them maybe you want to do an ultrasound, although it's not as effective, but it's probably better than not doing anything. And that's an individualized approach that some women want to do or and some do not want to do. Uh, so we kind of guide them that so that discussion is important and that discussion is carried on by the genetic counselor and also by the genetics expert provider. Do you usually recommend these screenings to be yearly or like multiple times a year? So for uh, for breast cancer, uh, once women with a BRCA1 or BRCA2 uh, hit age 30, we start, we add the mammogram, as I mentioned, to the MRI. We typically like to do the mammogram once a year and the MRI once a year, but they are spaced six months between one another. This way, we are doing some kind of screening uh, every six months. Uh, there is some scientific background to that uh, because we know that women with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, especially with BRCA1, we tend to see a something that we call in medical terms uh, interval cancer, meaning can breast cancer that can develop in an interval of time that is shorter than the one year time that we recommend usually for screening. So women in general get a mammogram once a year. So the time, you have like safe time to do that next mammogram or imaging is one year. For BRCA1 mutation carrier and maybe BRCA2, that might not be as safe. So we'd like to do something a little bit shorter than that. So we do the six month mammogram, then six months later the MRI, and then we keep on uh, that as long as they kept their breasts. Got it, okay. Um, do you normally ever recommend looking into the double mastectomy surgery? So when, when we look at where the uh, the field has moved it it took us a while to be able to learn that by doing good screening with mammograms and mri we are able to safely tell women with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation uh, and some other mutation now we always we refer to those mutations but there are other mutations so we do the same thing for all the other breast related mutations so we tell them this is pretty safe, that we can detect cancer early, early in a way that we can treat it. And majority of the times, so more than 90 to 95%, we are able to say we can achieve cure for those cancers. But that screening does not prevent breast cancer. It only prevents a bad outcome from breast cancer diagnosis. So some women would choose to do that if they want to keep their breasts, and some women would choose to do bilateral mastectomy or taking out both breasts so that they can decrease the risk of developing breast cancer. And really, this is a very, very personal decision. It can be driven by different uh, factors. One, fear. Uh, one, uh, like for example, seeing a mom or an aunt dying from breast cancer saying, well, I don't want to go through this. Or what we see lately is many women are working 
and they want to be available for the work and the family balance and say, I don't think I have time to go through cancer treatment, even if it's going to be caught early. So I'd rather go through the bilateral mastectomy. I always advise women to take their time, think about what they want, because this is not a decision that's reversible. Once the bilateral mastectomy is done, it is done. The good thing is we have very good reconstruction options, meaning women, when they end up doing this procedure, they can get good results uh, with reconstruction and getting their uh, you know, breasts, not the same way, the same shape, but as close as possible to what their natural breasts look like. So what does the risk level go down to after the bilateral mastectomy? And I would say in the hands of a good surgeon, a good surgeon meaning somebody who does this all the time, and a breast surgeon, that risk is goes down by 95 to 95%. So whatever that risk is, we decrease it by 90 to 95%, which is really a remarkable decrease in that risk. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it, it really is so powerful to have genetic testing as an option to know whether you are higher risk um, before cancer does come. And it's kind of knowledge is power in the sense of you can decide whether you want to be more proactive and get more screening or do the surgery if you want to lower your risk of cancer completely. So um, I definitely see genetic testing as such a positive. Are there any sort of drawbacks from genetic testing? Yeah. Can I just, I want to just touch base on this empowerment that you just, uh, you know, uh, touch base on because it's really, really important. And every time I meet a individual because men and women can be diagnosed with a genetic predisposition with a mutation, but especially women because they deal with this at a much younger age, like in their twenties, they know about their BRCA mutation or, you know, in their thirties when they just get the testing. I tell them this is important because that result empowers you because the majority and up till now, although genetic testing is so available up till now, many women with breast cancer who do have a genetic predisposition end up finding out about their genetic predisposition only after the diagnosis. So if they knew about it, they probably would have done something different. So that's why I always tell women, this is going to empower you so that you can be in charge of your health and you decide you want to do the intensive screening. And when it's time for you maybe to do a surgical procedure to prevent cancer, that's the time for you to do it. This is actually something I've been noticing since I tested positive myself, and I've been telling my friends and family members, um, a lot of them don't know about genetic testing. They don't know that it's an option. And a couple of them have said, like, my grandmother had breast cancer. Like, maybe this is something I should look into. So I really think that this conversation is so important just to get it out there that genetic testing is a thing. And it really can be so powerful to know Um, and empowering for women to know that they have the option of changing their outcome. Even if they're at a higher risk of different types of cancer, there really are so many different options out there that knowing all of your different options and having them on the table in front of you um, is really powerful and it's important. Absolutely, I mean, we've seen that when celebrities, like Mm -hmm. when Angelina Jolie talked about her BRCA1 mutation Mm -hmm. result, and we have seen at the time a surge in women asking for like do i need to do a bracken you know testing uh so the message was really great that she told you know women that you need to know about that risk so i think the messaging is important and the more we talk about it the more maybe celebrities and you know influentials talk about it the more people know about their this mm-hmm. now i'll take the same example with uh, with uh, miss jody when she talked about her BRCA one mutation she also talked about her bilateral mastectomy and the message was also that if i have a BRCA one mutation i need to do bilateral mastectomy and this is just not true mm-hmm. that's her choice because that's what she decided to do but women should speak with their providers and know and do what is best for them. But I think in general, the messaging is very important and we need more, uh, you know, like webinars, podcasts, or even influencers talking about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think like the misconception of genetic testing, is it's so strong right now because even when you start talking about genetic testing with the general population, they're like, 
their their answer is always, well, why would I want to know about it? I can't do anything about it, mm -hmm. right? So I think even the messaging of, yes, there are things that we can do about it. If we do find that you're high risk, there are, you know, extra screening, prophylactic surgeries. So I think that message messaging is also equally as important. I also did have another friend who um, asked her mother because she lost her grandmother to breast cancer. So I said, maybe your mom has gotten genetic tested. I don't know. Um, and she said her mom didn't want to know. And that's another thing that I've been kind of seeing more is some people just genuinely don't want to know which I understand that as being, it is scary. It's scary, it's anxiety inducing of whether cancer is going to become a part, of your, a part of your life later on down the road. But my mentality is being prepared for what you can um, and just being aware that it can be an option later on. I mean, the other thing is, even if you do test positive, it doesn't mean you're going to get cancer. And that's something I keep reminding myself oh, is right. it doesn't mean I have cancer right now. It doesn't mean that I'm going to get cancer. It just means that I am at higher risk of getting cancer. And I like the fact that I can know that and be knowledgeable about my own health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, this is what, you know, we always, and that's why Jess was mentioning that it's important for individuals who do testing to get some kind of support information so that they have one, the informed decision about the testing uh, and also what to do about it and to take away as much as possible that fear factor. And when individuals tell me that, well, I'm worried, I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna know if I have a mutation, I tell them, let's say you're 40 years old, you've been born for 40 years you've been living with that gene mutation so it didn't happen right now yeah. but what would happen right now is that you may know about it so that you can know what to do mm -hmm. as opposed to the putting it behind you and forgetting about it and then getting surprised with a cancer and as you mentioned not everyone with a brca or one or two or the other mutations not everyone develops cancer they're just at an increased risk we know that we have a this margin of this increased risk, and we can do something about it. So I guess looping back, to around, back around to my previous question, are there any drawbacks from the genetic testing, or it's more just the fact that you know that you are at higher risk? Have you had any patients who had any issues with the genetic testing? It doesn't sound like it's a super invasive or anything. It's just saliva test most of the time? Saliva yeah. or blood? Yeah, saliva or blood. Yeah, I mean, I will say the majority of people that come through genetic counseling do end up to go on to get genetic testing. Um, some people, you know, and that's why I think genetic counseling is so important um, to talk about the limitations of genetic testing because, of course, there are some, um, and to talk about the benefits as well. Um, but I would say the number one <laughs> reason that people end up not moving forward with genetic testing, other than the fear factor, because, you know, even after speaking to somebody about the benefits of genetic testing, um, you know, it's still, some people might still feel fearful about it and not want to know the information. Um, but the other thing is that there are some limitations when it actually comes to your genetic discrimination protection, right? So um, there is a law in place, it's called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act that protects you from being discriminated against by your health insurance. So they can't make decisions about coverage based on your genetic testing results. Um, but there are limitations for other insurances. So for like, for example, for life insurance, um, if you wanted to go out and get your own policy outside of your job, a larger policy, they're going to now ask you because they've wised up about your genetic testing results. And that can cause um, you to not be able to get the life insurance policy or for the premium to be higher. So a lot of times actually people that go on to do genetic testing, they actually make sure they have life insurance prior to doing genetic testing. But that is one of the reasons that people might you know, think twice about the testing. Um, and then really the, the cost factor used to be an issue, but isn't so much anymore. Um, now, even without insurance, uh, laboratories are offering $250 uh, patient pay options, and that's for coverage of all the genes that we've been talking about and more. Oh, wow. Um, so it's, it's, really, uh, it's really nice. Um, it's really, I think, opened the door to genetic testing for a lot of people. And then a lot of laboratories actually have great financial aid uh, for financial assistance policies as well. 
Nice. Is it typically covered by insurance? It is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Going back to the life insurance, which life insurance, long-term disability, all those uh, potential protections that are not part of your own health care, so they are still not protected, meaning there is no law that would protect individuals who get testing and it's positive for the genetic predisposition from being discriminated upon by those carriers for life insurance or for long-term disability, etc. Uh, luckily, the law that that has been there, or GINA, so Genetic uh, uh, Non-Discrimination Act, or Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, that law has been there since 2008, and it really protected many, many individuals who get the genetic testing, uh, and that's important. So hopefully with time, even that other, you know, what what we call maybe luxury insurances, life insurance, etc. Maybe with time we can just lobby and for the government to push, and maybe for the or lawmakers just to push for this to be included. Because I don't really think that individuals should not get testing because of this fear. We need to get as many of the ba- barriers out of the way so that everyone can get testing when they want to get the testing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you know if there's any change to the discriminatory behaviors if the surgeries are performed so BRCA for instance if the double mastectomy is performed and your risk is lowered down to that one to two percent or it's the it's like yeah it's a great much much and then also if you have the ovarian surgery so if you're taking the proper precaution to lower your risk does that factor in to insurance companies? It doesn't affect the, you know, I don't think it affects, but if if I'm gonna step back and say, well, if I'm in a, you know, on the side of the insurance company, in fact, knowing that information is helpful because those individuals are going to probably get the surgery, for example, to remove the ovaries and tubes and decrease the risk of ovarian cancer, which is a win-win situation. It's good for the women who did not develop ovarian cancer and for the insurance provider who is not going to pay for the very high uh, price and cost of medications and treatment for ovarian cancer. And the same applies for breast cancer. So, so and I think that's probably translates to why insurance also does not, not just the law, but also they feel that, well, it's good to know because we probably can lower our cost. And f- the same thing should apply to life insurance because you know those mm-hmm. women or those men with with a mutation are going to still live the same. If we know about it, we're going to still just live the same. Yeah. And I actually, I think it is trending in that direction. There are certain states that now do have protections in place, just not in the state of New Jersey, as, a, as far as I know now. Um, but, it, you know, it's it's looking like it will change in the next couple of years, which is good. But yeah, I agree. You know, I, I think there's there's other aspects that you have to weigh when you when you think about genetic testing. And if you're thinking about getting a life insurance policy or some other luxury insurance policy, um, you know, one, do you have other medical issues because that might actually take precedent when it comes to life and getting life insurance. Um, But also, you know, knowing this information might sometimes be more important. So it really just depends on where you are in your life. I'm going to circle back around to our initial jump into this conversation about numbers rising in diagnoses in younger women. Do you think that genetic testing has any sort of link to that? Do you think that women are screening more so then we're catching it earlier on? Do you think that that has any relation to the the number of diagnoses rising? It's possible, but it doesn't explain the trend. It's Mm -hmm. possible that women are more tuned to knowing and the family history, learning about their genetic predisposition, getting the screening but still it does not explain why we are seeing a younger trend of younger age and that trend of younger onset for breast cancer and other cancers as well are deaths rising as well deaths i guess in relation to breast cancer or it's more diagnoses and then being treated it's diagnosis luckily for the last 25 to 30 years breast cancer death has significantly uh, gotten, you know, I thought that I less. saw that statistic, yes. but I, w- I didn't yeah. write it down and I yeah. wasn't sure if that yeah. was Definitely has, fact. you know, we've improved so much our treatment of breast cancer. 
uh, and as we, you know, probably it's not the, you know, the, we need more time to talk about different types of breast cancer, but we do have different types of breast cancer. It's not all one disease. Mm -hmm. There's the hormone receptor positive, there's the HER2 positive, there's the triple negative breast cancer. So, and they don't all behave the same way and not, you know, so, and the treatment is not the same for all cancers. Certain types are more Certain aggressive. Certain types are more and, aggressive. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, 20 years ago, HER2 positive breast cancer used to be very aggressive. But since then, it didn't change its behavior. But what changed is our treatment option. So we have a HER2 targeted treatment with antibodies and biologics and chemotherapy that targets that type of breast cancer. So the outcomes have significantly improved in the last 15 to 20 years with that particular type of breast cancer. The same thing with hormone positive breast cancer. And we are seeing also improvement even in triple negative breast cancer uh, now that we started to add some other uh, treatment like immunotherapy that, that doesn't apply to everyone. But if we treat some women early on with triple negative breast cancer before surgery and we gave them immunotherapy plus chemo, also the outcomes have significantly improved. So that there is a big trend now to uh, probably treating more for you know certain type of breast cancers, but also getting much uh, better outcomes. What's the probability of passing along these genes from parents to children? And also does that change when both parents are positive versus whether it's just one? Yeah, I, I think it depends on uh, what genes are affected. Um, so like the BRCA genes and like many genes associated with cancer predisposition, they're inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. So what that means is in order to have that increased risk for cancer, you just need to have one of your BRCA2 genes, say, mutated, right? Because you have two of every gene, you get one from mom, one from dad. And then if you do have that one mutated, anytime you go on to have a child, you can either pass on your copy that does not have the mutation or the copy that does have the mutation. 50-50. Right? Yep, so it's 50-50 okay. when it comes to the kids. And if, say, your child does not have a mutation, then they can't pass on. It doesn't skip generations. Is there a certain age that you recommend getting genetic testing done by? Is When you reach a certain age, do you think it's kind of not worth getting genetic testing so knowledge is important right yeah but at the same time you don't want someone to be consumed and very anxious about the risk especially when they're very young and they're you know going to college and they're trying to figure out what to do with their life um, but there were actually studies that were done as to what's the best time or should we not tell let's say for somebody who has a BRCA mutation and their daughter is 14 or 15, should we tell her or not? And studies were done that, in fact, you can tell them, and it does not affect them if they know. In fact, they, they do better by knowing. We tell them not to do testing. You know, they should not get tested until they are above age 18 so that they are adults, they know, they make that decision. Because what if they don't want to know? And that's mm -hmm. an option, right? Yeah. Not that, you know, you don't have to do and what, you know, uh, you're told to do. And that's why I think at age 18, you have to know about it. Uh, when I counsel uh, younger women, I tell them, go through college. Do you know what you need to do right now, career, etc. Uh, but know that you are at risk so that if you do feel something in the breast, when you go to your doctor, you tell them, hey, I, I know that I probably don't qualify now for mammogram or testing, but my mom has a BRCA mutation. So maybe you need to check me out a bit more. So knowledge is important, but going back to your you know, question, it's what is the best age? Probably by age 25, women should know whether they have the mutation or not, because that's when we start screening with MRI, breast MRIs. Mm -hmm. And what I tell also you know, young women, if they feel that they don't wanna know about the genetic testing, I tell them, if your mom or your dad has a BRCA mutation, we would treat you as if you have it, meaning we would screen with a breast MRI and maybe mammogram until you get to know whether it's your test is negative or positive because we don't want to miss on the opportunity of doing a screening because we know it's a 50-50 if somebody has a parent mm -hmm. with that mutation. Yeah, and going off of that, there's really no cap to the age as well. We see plenty of patients that are 90 years old, and it might really? not affect. Yeah, it might not affect oh. their medical management, but they have children, right? So it's a good opportunity to get that information, and so that they can get testing and inform their children as well. Yeah. We didn't touch base on how genetics has transformed 
uh, outcomes, not just by screening, but also by treatment. So now, because we know about the, we mentioned Lynch syndrome, we, we've talked also about the BRCA1 or BRCA1, BRCA2 gene mutations. So there are specific medications that potentially target the cancers that are linked to those different genetic uh, syndromes, meaning uh, there's a class of drugs called PARP inhibitors. They are oral drugs that we give for women who have metastatic or maybe early stage ovarian cancer when they have the BRCA1 mutation or BRCA2 mutation. And in the last six years, this has become available for women with breast cancer and BRCA mutation. And similarly, for early stage breast cancer, they might be eligible for that. And that medication can increase and you know, improve the, the, the chances of cure for those women who end up taking it. The same thing applies to prostate cancer that's linked to those, those mutations, pancreatic cancer. So really the field has moved to understanding genetics, understanding risk, what to do about your screening, about your risk reducing uh, procedures, and also medications to, for treatment if somebody has unfortunately metastatic cancer linked to those mutations, or early stage and improving the outcomes and the treatment. And the same thing for Lynch syndrome, where we screen individuals for colon cancer more often than you know what we tell uh, people to do colonoscopies, but also some of those cancers, they respond better to immunotherapy drugs than you know other cancers, just because of that gene mutation. It really is crazy the amount of options that are out there now for treatments and screenings and everything like that. It's like mind-blowing how far we've come. It truly is. It is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think another important um, thing to note about genetic testing is that it has changed so much you know, throughout the years. Um, I had mentioned earlier, originally it was just BRCA1 and 2 testing available, and now there's panel testing. There's a whole bunch of different types of technologies that you can uh, put towards genetic, genetic testing. So if you've had genetic testing in the past, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't qualify for new genetic testing or that you know genetic testing might not be good for you because maybe you know the BRCA genes weren't tested as well as they can be tested now or there are other genes that you should be tested for now. So that, I think that's also an important um, thing to note because I've, I've seen so many patients where the, you know come to me that say, I've had BRCA testing before, you know, I don't need genetic testing anymore, but there are other genes out there that they can benefit from as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank you both so much for joining me today. I hope that we empower at least one person from this talk to go and get their genetic testing done, but to also keep up with their screenings and do whatever they can for preventative care. Um, so thank you both so much. Thanks for having us. And again, I think the message is really, really important for, and you mentioned one, and I think more than one individual will be saved, will have better outcomes for them and for their family just because of listening to this, because I know that there are those individuals out there listening. Thank you so much.